You are listening to Radio Free Humanity, the Marxist Humanist Podcast. My name is Brendan Cooney. And I'm Andrew Kleiman. On this episode, we welcome back Guillaume Murcia Lopez to talk about a paper he's writing defending Marx's law of the tendential fall on the rate of profit from some Spanish critics of Marx. To hear more episodes of Radio Free Humanity, to read about the issues discussed, or to join in the conversation, please do visit MarxistHumanistInitiative.org. You can make a donation to the podcast there, subscribe to the RSS feed, and all those good things. While our podcast is hosted by Marxist Humanist Initiative, the views expressed by the co-hosts and guests of Radio Free Humanity are their own. They do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of MHI. In just a moment, we'll be discussing Marx's law of the tendential fall on the rate of profit with Guillaume Murcia Lopez. But first, as we do in every episode, Andrew and I will take a few minutes to talk about some current events. So for our current events section today, we're going to talk about some post-election reflection on the issue of police reform in America. Andrew, you found this article by Rachel Ramirez in Vox from November 13th called Police Reform Was a Big Winner This Election. Why did you think this was a good piece for us to discuss today? Well, this is one of the facets of the uh, election that has gotten almost no coverage. It was quite a comprehensive roundup of different ballot measures, you know, in the November 3rd election and how police reform fared. The, the main takeaway for me is, uh, yeah, there are still a lot of people in this country who do not like the system of policing. I want to do something about it. And this was in many places in the country. Many places, for instance, in California, San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, but also Portland, Washington State, Philadelphia, and, and even in the so-called red states, the various ballot measures passed. I don't think that they're going to do a hell of a lot of good. But the other good thing about this article is that the author, Rachel Ramirez, quotes a lot of uh, activists, people who are for defunding and the police and so forth, and their, their heads are, are on straight. They, they know that this is a very long struggle and that these things are just first steps. The, the main kind of um, reform that passed was basically to have uh, community boards, you know, civilian oversight of police departments. Uh, that was the main measure, although there were various kinds of things on different ballots in different places. That was the main kind of measure. And look, that stuff is not new. That stuff is like 50 years old. And it, it, it just never really worked. You know, I, th- I think people are very aware of that. But it, right after George Floyd's murder, we have this huge nationwide and international uprising against police violence and for black lives. Uh, And for the first time ever, you saw in the opinion polls a nationwide majority, you know, including like even maybe a majority of white people, but there was certainly a nationwide majority for black lives against police violence and so forth. And you had writers like Ta-Nehisi Coates, and I think Adam Serwer were both saying, you know, this is a huge change. It looks like for the first time ever in the United States, we have uh, an anti-racist majority. And then more recent opinion polls showed, you know, somewhat of a dip, not a return to where it was before, but somewhat of a dip in support for things like Black Lives Matter. So, you know, the question was, was that just a flash in the pan? You know, was that just something you did during COVID summer or something? It doesn't seem to be the case. The measures on the ballots were limited, their window dressing when all was said and done, unless the activists can force these measures to have real meaning. It's, it, it, it's just, uh, there's going to be a fight about what these, you know, community uh, review boards and civilian uh, oversight, it, it, there's always going to be a fight about the character of that. So it's not like a done deal that it's just a window dressing. But there is there is a strong segment of this country, even if it's not literally a majority, there's a very strong segment of this country that's getting clear about what, what the system of policing is, is really about and how it's racist and basically it's, it's not reformable. 
as one of the activists, of course, says, uh, quoted in the article, it's, it's not that the system is broken or needs to be fixed. It's working just the way it's meant to work. Yeah, here in Philadelphia, there were three different ballot measures around police reform, one about sort of further limiting stop and frisk, another about changing the P- police advisory commission to, to work better, um, be less toothless. But I think it was pretty widely understood that these were not going to solve any of these problems on their own. The stop and frisk ballot measure in particular was widely seen as pretty symbolic. But I thought, I thought it was still significant that people were even mobilizing around this um, in the middle of this very contentious general election where Philadelphia was thought to be ground zero for uh, as a swing state and as a democratic city in a swing state. I was still getting text messages from activist groups um, encouraging me to vote yes on these reform measures, even um, in the middle of all this general election chaos and and knowing full well that these were not the be-all and end-all, um, it was still thought important to show sort of the, the mass support for police reform in the city. Right, and there there was a, a police killing uh, in the midst of the election turnout campaign in Philly. Yeah, as you talked about, you know, although it did not get any sort of national attention, people didn't entirely subjugate all of their activity. There, there, were, there were protests. Yeah, just uh, like a little over a week before the election, there was a police killing in Philadelphia. A young man, young black man, Walter Wallace Jr., was shot in broad daylight by uh, two police officers in West Philly. And West Philly erupted into protests again, and they lasted for several days. Um, there was, you know, massive police response. The National Guard was called out. M- many parts of the city were boarded up. There was a curfew imposed um, for several days. Um, and, uh, you know, this city was so worried about the volatility of this s- situation with the pandemic and the general election and the the protests over Walter Wallace's killing um, that they delayed releasing the body cam footage from the police officers until after the election because they were worried it was going to just be, I think, too crazy, uh, especially with all the violence that was anticipated around the election. But I'll tell you, people in the city did not, even though we were, everyone was hyper-focused on the importance of Philadelphia for defeating Trump, that did not take people's attention away from uh, the issue of policing in the city. And even after the election, I went to one of those first um, protect the vote protests that, that happened on the day after the election, and there were a lot of Walter Wallace Jr. signs at that protest. This is all to the good because, you know, we, we've tended to have a lot of single issue focus where the, the issues get really single, really narrowed down, like turn out the vote or protest police violence. Well, it's, it's all part of the same struggle, for God's sakes. And I think this election has made it dawn on a large number of people, it seems, for whom it did not dawn on before, that the problem isn't just Trump. You know, it's Trumpism. And the problems of Trumpism emanate at least largely from the Trump bite base which is it's a minority in this country but it's a sizable minority <laughs> really sizable yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's a it's the second largest group of people in the country uh i think people are aware that we've got a very big struggle ahead and that the struggle continues that was one of the interesting things about rachel ramirez's article in vox you get two different views you know from activists one of which is well as long as you know we see police killings and arbitrary violence violence being broadcast from people's cell phones and on TV and so forth. These protests are continue and the push to reform the police is going to continue. And you get another view of somebody saying, I'm just really afraid that people's attention is going to turn elsewhere. You know, you've got uh, us few activists who are totally down with the cause and we're working, working, working. But I'm really worried that other people are just going to say, okay, look, we, we got these ballot measures. Everything's fine and good. And they're going to walk away. I mean, nobody Nobody knows, nobody knows what's going to be the case, but, uh, you know, you got those two views. Well, that's all the time we have to discuss current events in this episode, but I'm sure we will talk about this topic much more in future episodes. Up next, our conversation with Guillem Muthia Lopez about the rate of profit. We are happy to have back on the podcast Guillem Muthia Lopez for a second time on the podcast. Uh, regular listeners will remember he 
worked on the translation for Andrew's book, Reclaiming Marxist Capital. He's translated several of Andrew's articles, and we're happy to have him back on the podcast. He's also um, a contributor to a project called CIVCOM, C-I-V-COM. Guillaume, do you want to explain briefly what that project is? Yeah, hello. Thank you for having me again. Yeah, the project is just this website where some people, some friends and some comrades and I work on translating and, and publishing material to raise awareness and to discuss the use of, of new technologies uh, for economic planning and democratic participation. What's the URL? It's sipcom.org org or org rg sorry so what we're discussing with gm today is his contribution to a book collection that's forthcoming that'll be published in spain and his contribution to the book collection will be a response to a recent book by two spanish left philosophers luis alegre and carlos fernandez liria and the name of their book is el orden de el capital which means the order of marx's capital or the structure of Marx's capital. So Guillaume will tell us something about what their book is about. He'll tell us in specifically the part of the book that he'll be responding to and what he doesn't like about what they've said and what he thinks the, the real deal is. Basically, the their book, El Orden del Capital, is a very extensive book dealing with how the structuring of capital needs to be understood, putting in the words Marx in the Republican tradition tradition as uh, sort of like um, an inheritor of the Enlightenment project. And the authors deal with a lot of topics, which actually my response has nothing to do with. So I'm very, I'm very focused in a single part, but to give it a bit of a, a wide view of, of what the book is about, they want to sort of reclaim the legal principles of the Republican state and say how liberalism is incompatible with that. And they want to reclaim the Republican project, so to speak. Uh, defend the fact that Marxist ideas were not only compatible with it, but they are the only way to fulfill it, so to speak. So they deal and they explain a lot of the stuff Marx talks about in Capital, or at, at least their interpretation of, of, of what Marx talks about, his value theory, exploitation, a lot of stuff. But there's this, not even a full chapter, it's a part of a chapter, and actually it's a part where they use this typeset, which they at the beginning state that they're going to use in parts which they feel it's not something that's essential that you could skip over if I remember correctly so they yeah they actually say that they, they they deal with the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall they explain what it is about and then they say how in their reading of the Marxist value theory the law doesn't hold for reasons I'll probably deal with later so that's, wow, that's original. Somebody says Marx's <laughs> law of the tendential fall and the rate of profit doesn't hold. I've never come across that yeah. before. <laughs> yeah. That's wow. It, basically. What, what original thinking. Um, well, maybe their maybe their arguments are original. We'll come to that. So. Yeah, you, you characterize this book project as a defense of Marx's method, but it's not just method, it's actual arguments he makes and, and theories that are being defended mm -hmm. in various ways as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your own chapter, that's going to focus pretty much exclusively on the law of the financial fall and the rate of profit? Yeah, and it's actually, well, not really just focusing on Fernandez, Lidia, and Alegre, but on the whole controversy about the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. I summarize the debate and the first half of it. I devote a lot of, uh, of extension to the debate you guys had a few years ago, uh, which was kickstarted by the publishing of uh, Michael Heinrich, the a German scholar of an article or a series of articles, if I remember correctly, on Monthly Review. And I summarized those articles and then the responses by some authors, including Michael Roberts and Guillermo Carchetti, and then your response with Alan Freeman, uh, Nick Potts, and I think Brendan was also a co-author, if I'm not mistaken. And Alexei Gusev. So you summarize the whole kind of previous history of the debate mm -hmm. over Marx's yeah. law of potential fall in the rate of profit, with particular yeah. emphasis on uh, what Heinrich wrote in a monthly review and our response and others' responses to it. 
Uh, do you do more than summarize? Do you draw any conclusions from that discussion? Well, more than conclusions, at the, the first half, I wanted to, to make the debate known to Spanish speakers. So I, I don't even focus on the debates that had been going before. I kind of start with the uh, Heinrich article and then your responses. I don't draw any any conclusions other than, well, I call it in, in some sense. I think that your last response, the unmaking of Marxist capital, as far as I know, uh, Heinrich himself didn't respond to it. And I think that the point that you raise are very quite convincing so i just try to summarize them and make them known to the readers and then i move on in the second half to how spanish authors have received and taken part in that debate in in your in your chapter do you point out that heinrich did not respond to our criticism yeah yeah, yeah i do yeah i mean i i think that that is important because when one has a debate in a scholarly context you know in the sciences and whatever this is not just politics where people say this and other people say that the whole point of a debate is to resolve outstanding issues mm -hmm. uh and first of all if there's no response that 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 whether positive or negative that's that's not a good thing yeah because it kind of leaves things up in the air but if somebody puts forward an argument or a set of arguments and there are counter arguments and they then the counter arguments go unchallenged it's understood that that's it the debate is over it's conceding the and especially interesting that you point that out because like i said he did respond to some of the articles that were responding in the first place to to the first one he wrote he did write a response to I think it was Michael Roberts and Karkedi, but he didn't respond to your article, and I don't know why. But it, to me, that kind of gives the impression that you are that you are saying that he he considered the points or he didn't have any other arguments to back his main point. Right. Okay. So Allegri and Fernandez, they're both philosophers, if I understand. Yeah. But in part of their book, where they put in special type to say, you can ignore this, they go into a heavy-duty, rather technical discussion of Marx's theory of crisis. Do they have any particular expertise in this area? That's one of my questions. And a related question is, what is a discussion of that, Marx's crisis theory, law of tendential fall, and the rate of profit? What is that doing in a book that is billing itself and principally concerned with the relationship of Marx's capital to the Republic? tradition and to the enlightenment yeah so as far as i know they don't have any specific expertise in the topic i from what i know i might be wrong but my my hypothesis and i stress that i might be wrong about this but because i, I don't really know for sure but my hypothesis is that this bit of the chapter that i'm referring to comes from luis alegre's doctoral dissertation because i've looked at it online and there's a part of the dissertation which looks very similar to what's written what's what's printed in the book so it might be a case of using the the points he made there and re-elaborating them or rewriting them for for the book you ask what does that have to do with, with the main thrust or the theme of the book one of the points they make is that they want to go against or they want to oppose the what they sort of refer as the orthodox Marxist idea that there is a, a teleology from capitalism to socialism and communism. And they say, yeah, yeah that's wrong. Um, that's something that people have defended, but it's, it's not right. So my guess is that they included that bit about the, the law as um, an attack or, or a counter argument to what, and this is part of my criticism, this is some of why they understand the law is and and it it also draws on what you wrote uh, against uh, Henrik with Freeman and Hudson and so on that they think that people who defend the relevance of the law are exposing it as it is uh, an argument that the rate of profit must fall it must invariably fall there is no no way to overcome it and that means that capitalism will eventually collapse and it will you know dissolve and transform into socialism or whatever so because they see the law as that and the people who defend the law as just defending that they say hey no that whole theory is wrong and 
Also, the law is wrong itself. Even if you wanted to use the law to defend that, you can't because the law is wrong. So it's two separate things, but they're connected in that sense. Yeah, it's clear. Basically, they're attacking a straw man version of Marx, which talks about inevitability of falling trend in the rate of profit throughout life of capitalism, leading to collapse. It's important to clarify what Marx's law is and how it's like entirely different from that, both with respect to the so-called inevitable trend downward that's never, you know, broken. And also with respect to the idea that the system is going to collapse because of the fall in the rate of profit or collapse on its own in the normal way in which people understand collapse rather than, you know, social revolution. What Marx projected was, was social revolution. The expropriators are expropriated. That That's not just like a house of cards falling down. But the thing is, there are a lot of people who on one side or the other believe in or believe that Marx, like they believe, Allegri and Fernandez, that, that Marx had such a theory. There are people who do have that kind of theory of an inevitable, you know, downward trend, come what may, and of the collapse of capitalism because of that. You know, the response to Heinrich that we wrote a number of years ago, that got a very, very negative reaction from those kinds of people. They were at one point followers of Heinrich Grossmann, Paul Maddock, and now I guess they're followers of, of Michael Roberts. So so, you know, on both sides, I mean, there's bad people on both sides. You know, they, they, it, people don't really in the main care about like Marx and what he thought. They're concerned to construct some kind of Marx. And if they can't use Marx's own texts and words responsibly to construct that interpretation, they'll just make things up. And, and that's what they do. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, and it, it doesn't go well because people just see seem to want to reduce everything to these kind of straw man issues of like, you know, is capitalism going to collapse on its own? Can you prove a priori just sitting in your chair that the rate of profit just got to go down, 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 down forever? I, I don't understand why people are so interested in debasing all questions and, and putting them in su such a simplistic way. And I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. First of all, how, how prevalent, you know, is that straw man? man version among the people you talk to and and secondly you know when we encounter it why does this keep re-emerging what is the power over people of this kind of straw man version of marx which is just not in his text first of all it's sort of a very very common myth it's even common myth between people who are themselves in no way supporters of marx's ideas or anything like i can't remember the times i've read someone on the internet someone who's a liberal or, or, or supports uh, neoclassic economics or, or whatever, uh, talk about, yeah, Marx, some of this stuff is interesting and it was cool back then when he wrote it, but he's so wrong about his predictions because, you know, we're living in capitalism and he was supposed to have predicted that it will fall. And it's uh, sort of like if they treat him like if he was a prophet or some religion and then they insist on saying that Marxism uh, is a religion. So it's uh, sort of a circular you know, reasoning. They are assuming what they needed to prove. They say, yeah, yeah, he, he was predicting this or that, you know, religious thinking, oh, this is going to come no matter what. And so it is a religion. But then you ask, in which part did he predict that? When did he make those predictions? And they can't come with a convincing answer. I, earlier I mentioned, you, you asked me about the, the state of the of the debate and the law of the tendency of rate of profit to fall. I said that I didn't find that many people before uh, Luis Alegria and Fernandez Liria's book about the topic but, for example, someone who I did find that spoke or wrote about it, actually, I think in, he published this in the same year the, in which the book was published, is this other philosopher whose name is Cesar Ruiz San Juan, who is actually translated and has written the, the introduction to Michael Heinrich's Introduction to Capital book in, in Spanish. And, well, he opposes the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall because he makes this this very point that it can't lead to the collapse of capitalism 
and hence this is then something that doesn't seem reasonable there is no no law that says that the rate of profit must fall in Marx's writings and he started to have doubts as Michael Heinrich has proved and yeah yeah then so it's wrong we need to jettison it so it's something that's very common but if that's your view or your interpretation uh, and it's you're sort of splitting hairs or trying to very hard to force your interpretation there you would at need at, at least need to acknowledge that there are some other interpretations that aren't trying so hard to force uh, their view on Marx's writings and that makes sense it doesn't make sense that you are trying to uh, so hard to say no well this doesn't this doesn't work in Marx's ideas uh, so he probably must have discarded it uh, later on in his life if there is another interpretation that makes sense everything fit together and you don't need to start assuming that yeah probably like Heinrich does in in his article yeah he probably had doubts about the law because he didn't write that much about it in his last few years so that means that he discarded it well you can't really assume that from not writing about the topic Heinrich does a lot of things including that one I just reread what he wrote in response he, he pulls out a lot of tricks and uses his knowledge of the German um manuscripts to kind of give everybody this impression that he has exposed the fact that the law of intentional fall in the rate of profit is really Engels is doing rather than Marx himself. You know, Marx left these manuscripts and Marx didn't uh, give the chapters titles and I mean, he, he his actual evidence is just that Engels did some did some stylistic editing to take manuscripts and turn them into a, 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 a chapter or chapters part of a book and it, it really is a forced in, in interpretation as you're saying but it's very popular I'll tell you why I think it's popular among the people who are Marxists I mean it's pretty obvious why the people who are anti-Marx explicitly it's pretty obvious why they glom onto this kind of thing. But among the people who are supposedly call themselves Marxists or whatever, what they really like isn't Marx. What they really like is what they can do with Marx, right? And so what they want is to take the actual texts, acid wash them, turn them into blank pages, and rewrite them in accordance with their own goals and aims and interests. That's that's my view as to what's going on. What do you think about that? I think I mentioned in the previous chapter where I talked to you guys that there was this video on YouTube where Luis Alegre and Fernandez Lidia were talking about Marx. It was sort of a like 200th anniversary or, or, or whatever. And they were talking and he was saying, Luis Alegre, he was saying, yeah, uh, in our book uh, El Orden del Capital we tried to give an interpretation of Marx that made sense in a lot of ways, save for a few things which didn't really fit. And one of the things he mentions is the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall so yeah we needed to discard that and i was surprised at that because you know it's like what you're saying okay then you are not making sense of the whole thing you are you know exposing your ideas and don't say that this is a book only about uh, what marx was saying or or the order of his book if you are going to criticize or to debunk uh, what he wrote when there are other interpretations that make sense but also the funny thing is that someone in the comments was writing you know he was criticizing the these words and saying yeah no I don't think it makes sense because the law of the tendency of rate of profit to fall was something that Marx held in very high regard blah 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 and someone answered to him no that has been debunked that has been you know it, it, it no longer applies or it's not relevant because Michael Henry can cover some some lost fragments or something like that uh, where he explicitly <laughs> repudiated it or, or something like that you know like he like Mark himself said no okay I, I abjure I uh, I no longer think that the law of the rate of profit to fall applies or is or is consistent or whatever Right, and in fact, in fact, Heinrich does not go that far to say. Yeah, that. yeah, yes, no, 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 yeah. no. So, so but it's he, like he 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 gives people that impression. It always ends up with, you know, somebody supposedly having definitively disproved Marx. And even when they don't make that claim, the conclusions that are drawn are, are always so extreme. Uh, there's there's a lot of bad faith to this. But let me ask you, you're responding to their, their book and especially to what they say about crisis theory and the law of potential fall and the rate of profit. Why did you choose this as what you wanted to respond to? In other words, I, I'd never heard of these authors. Are they important in 
in, in Spain? Yeah, they are. They are very important authors and they actually have quite a following, including people who I think are very, very smart and, and people who I admire. If I'm not mistaken, I think they were founding members or at least sort of involved with Podemos, you know, the political party. I think that they left the party and they joined a split or something like that that happened. Not really familiar with the details, but they're no longer in Podemos. Uh, but yeah, they've got quite a following. I think actually one of them has just started a YouTube channel and he talks about Marx and, and whatnot. Uh, not Luis Alegre, Fernandez Lidia. Right. Okay, so you've told us basically the thrust of what they want to argue about the law of natural fall and the rate of profit, Marx's crisis theory, but you're concerned to scrutinize and respond to their arguments. What are what are the, the main arguments they make against Marx's law? Uh, so one of the arguments they make is that you can't defend, you can state that the fall in the rate of profit is the law and the increase in the rate of exploitation, which we, which is one of the contracting causes that Marx explains after he explains the law itself, is a contracting cause. But, uh, you know, in their way, it could also be the law uh, on another law or it could be the law and then the contracting cause be the, the fall in the rate of profit. I mean, it sounds a little bit like the Paul Sweezy argument, and I think also Joan Robinson's argument from way back when that the counteracting tendencies, there's no reason to believe they can't f- permanently forestall the fall in the rate of profit. Yeah, so that's right. Sweezy and, and Robinson, basically, as far as I remember, they limit themselves to saying the counteracting factors that raise uh, the rate of surplus value, S over V, surplus value relative to variable capital, they can always cause it to rise faster than the organic composition of capital constant to variable capital, C over V, uh, so that the rate of profit can rise rather than fall, even though the law of potential fall in the rate of profit says you know, C over V tends to rise, uh, to rise, and by itself that would cause the uh, rate of profit to fall. They argue that the counteracting factors can always more than off- offset that. Yeah. As far as I know, they don't make this other argument like, well, if the other uh, factors are stronger, why don't you call them the law and and, and the, there's no reason to call the other thing a law? You know, that's just stupid. That's like saying there is no law of gravitation because buildings stand instead of collapsing. The, the, the fact that the buildings stand means that the counteracting factors are, in this case, stronger than the uh, gravitational force, okay? But that doesn't mean there's no law of gravitation. So, I mean, that's just a really stupid point. And, and Sweezy, Sweezy and Robinson, that's not the, the point that they're making. Mm-hmm. I think that maybe their opposition to priming that as the law has to do with what I mentioned before, the theological stance they're trying to, to attack or to refute. And it's sort of saying, hey, there is no inevitable law. Like the law was, you know, the statement of this must happen. Whatever happens, this will eventually fall. So they're kind of saying, yeah, no, no, the rate of profit is not doomed to fall. So that means that capitalism is that is not necessarily going to collapse on its own. So maybe that's the reason they are putting forward the claim that, yeah, this doesn't need to be the law and the contracting causes. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm absolutely convinced that you've got their motivation right, even though you're speculating that, you know, I've, I've read over the years, lots of people, and they make that kind of exact argument, that there aren't that many kinds of moves one can make in a debate like this. And I don't see that they've done anything original here. Kind of everything that they say, I've, I've, I've read before, you know, I could probably repeat it all in my sleep. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I understand their motivation. Their argument is is nonsense. That's all I'm trying to say. The actual argument is nonsense. Not all laws are statements of inevitability. And then teleology is, is a whole different issue entirely. Not that it has nothing to do with these things, but these are three distinct sets of issues. Inevitability, law, telos. These are three different things, and, and they just mush it all together and, and, and produce some sort of straw man thing. I mean, my problem is it impugns the character of the law on specious grounds. You can't say this isn't really a law because buildings stand. The, the, the argument is really analogous to that. That's an exact analogy, and it's it's horrible. It's a terrible argument. Okay, so then they've got this argument, and this is the exact argument that Heinrich makes a few years later, you know, the Sweezy-Robinson argument that the rate of surplus value can always rise at a more rapid pace than the uh, organic composition of capital, or actually value composition of capital. And therefore, instead of the rate of profit falling when there's labor-saving technological change, uh, the rate of profit can always rise. 
So is there anything else uh, that, that they said? Any other argument that they make? Well, yeah, they build this uh, this model or, or this mathematical example where they purportedly uh, show how the rate of profit can't fall by the reasons that Marx says it should fall by the increase in the social productivity of labor. They sort of build, if I remember correctly, uh, this model based around two commodities, iron and corn, if I'm not mistaken, and then they they deduce the relative values to each other, how much iron you can get per corn, per unit of corn, and how much, how many units of corn can get for iron in exchange, blah, blah, blah. So then they show that when productivity rises, the actual rate of profit tends to rise too. And then they say, well, that this shows that the rate of profit, and they they explicitly say it can fall, maybe it falls, that, that's something that job that we leave to the economists and I'm quoting them here something they we leave to the economists but it can't be for the reasons that Marx explained so in the case it happens you, know, you can observe a, rate, a fall in the rate of profit yeah you can observe that empirical data can show you that but it won't be for the reasons that Marx explained in his book at least according to our interpretation of, of his writing okay so as we would say in the United States they're trying to have all of their bases covered <laughs> um, yeah. It's a baseball analogy. So they, they, they give us the Sweezy and Robinson argument that the rate of profit doesn't have to fall for the reasons that Marx's law says. And then they give us the Okishio theorem, Okishio's argument that the rate of profit can't possibly fall for the reasons that Marx says. And instead of heavy-duty matrix algebra formulation, they give us numerical examples with iron and, and, and corn. But it's the same kind of model, the same kind of reasoning. So they're covering all the bases, and so they want to say it doesn't have to fall for the reasons Marx said, and they can't, in fact, fall for the reasons Marx says. Now, you say that they show, by means of this iron-corn example, that the rate of profit can't fall. Well, yeah, they, they, they show it, but do they have any sneaky, hidden assumptions that they don't make clear to people that are premises of that demonstration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they are starting from a simultaneous and physicalist approach, even though they don't say it, they don't explicitly state it, maybe because they assume that's the only one that you can, that you can use to read Marx or whatever, but once you start Digging into the numbers and the and the numerical examples they give, it's clear that it is a physicalist approach because their uh, rate of profits are calculated among the relative price of iron with regards to corn, and same with the with corn, and both are calculated regarding the physical quantities that they invest and produce in each one of the sectors. So, if you wanted to say it like that, they are concerned with how much stuff you get into the production process and how much stuff comes out and of and what's the alternative to that? Well, there could be, like we mentioned in the in the previous chapter, uh, the temporalist approach, temporal single system interpretation of Marx's value theory. You don't need to force inputs and outputs to have the same value. Right, but what, when you look at production and the results of production, you know, what's what's the alternative to looking at the stuff that goes in and the stuff that comes out? Ah, right. Yeah, you can focus on value and on prices. In the model that they build, value doesn't really play a role. Value ends up being sort of is sort of like the exchange value of how how much you can get, you know, how how much iron you can get for for corn and stuff. It's just physical quantities that you want to. But then value doesn't play a role, and the determination of value by the socially necessary labor time that workers need to devote to produce the commodities is no longer something that determines value. It's just, you know, the ratios of exchange of, of the different commodities. Yeah, you said that the, the trick, the hidden assumptions that allow them to so-called show that the rate of profit can't fall, the same hidden assumptions that are there in the Buo Kishio of Kishio theorem fame, John Romer of John Romer fame, and, and, and so forth. it's physicalism and consequently simultaneism. Brendan knows what that means. I know what that means. But could you give like a, a, a short definition of those terms for our listeners who might not know? 
Yeah, I think you mentioned in your book that Ian Steedman himself used the term physical quantities approach in his book Marx after Sraffa. Physical quantities approach or physicalism, it's the approach where gets it draws its conclusions from the functioning of capitalist economies uh, using models in which the only determinants of values, relative prices, profit, and the rate of profit are physical quantities or Specifically, technology and real wages. You know, what you can get with your money. Not just money itself, but real wages, physical quantities of what you get with it. Simultaneism, I think I mentioned before, is the simultaneous valuation of inputs and outputs. Like trying to force that the commodities, when they're used as inputs, need to have the same value as when they come out as outputs. Yeah, you got it right. To kind of like put it all together for our listeners. So it's not really that there are no values or no value in their model. It's the fact that value plays no determining role. Values are being determined in the model and prices are being determined in the model strictly by physical quantities. In other words, this technology and real wages. The way the model so-called determines the values and prices is by assuming that the price of a unit of something that goes into production is the same as the price of the unit of the same thing that comes out of production. So if you've got a coal production and coal gets used to produce coal, so, you know, like a ton of coal at the start of the process has to be worth just as much, no more, no less than a ton of coal coming out, which is obviously not the case. But when you, you doctor things in that manner and you make values totally dependent on these physical quantities with those kinds of assumptions yeah you can you can show that that thing has to not fall but but rise so we want to get to your your response to all of this but one thing i'm interested in particular do you do anything with the problem that they call the result of you know their calculations a rate of profit you know, I, I've made this argument that, like, this is not a rate of profit, and, you know, it's a misnomer to call it a rate of profit, and I, I don't get anywhere with that argument. I, it, to me, it seems obvious that it's not really a rate of profit that's being calculated because it's not profit as a percentage of investment. But I don't know. What, what's your view of this, and, and do you make anything of that kind of uh, discussion? Yeah, I don't think it is what you will usually understand, what in common parlance people might refer to it. It definitely doesn't make sense to refer to it as a rate of profit when discussing Marx's ideas on the rate of profit, since it, it makes part of his theory to not only look wrong, but, you know, go in the opposite way. And if by rate of profit we mean the money we invest and the profit we get, the percentage of profit we get with regards to the money we invest, Invested. Yeah, I don't understand either how can that be called a rate of profit. You know, you could say the rate of physical, oh, I don't know what you would call it. Physical self-expansion or something. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Physical surplus or, or whatever, right? Or, but not yeah. rate of profit. Okay, so the, the top number of the rate of profit, technically known as numerator, the top number is profit, okay? In, in a rate of profit and in what they're doing. In a rate of profit, though, the bottom number, known as denominator, is the amount of capital value that's invested. What is the, the bottom number in what they're doing? It, it's, it's the replacement cost of the means of production. It, it's, it's, what, it's, it's what the amount of money that it would take today to buy all of that stuff from scratch, rather than how much was actually invested in it in the past. In just a moment, we will get to the end of our interview with Guillaume. But first, uh, we're going to hear a few words from Angela Clark of Marxist Humanist Initiative, the organization which sponsors our podcast. Marxist Humanist Initiative, or MHI, aims to contribute to the transformation of this capitalist world by projecting, developing, and concretizing the philosophy of Karl Marx and its further development in the Marxist humanism articulated by Raya Donayevskaya. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and today's many other social, political, and economic crises make this a moment to engage people in discussion of these ideas. In the U.S., we are faced with the threat of Trumpism triumphing and all-out authoritarianism extinguishing our right to carry on these discussions. Yet at the same moment, the multiracial movement for black lives has spread to every corner of the country and the world, launching a flood of activism and new ideas 
that deepen the concept of freedom. MHI is dedicated to the task of proving theoretically that an alternative to capitalism is possible. We are distinguished by our economic analyses in which we do not merely assert but demonstrate that the only opposite to the current world economic system is its abolition and replacement with one not based on the production of, quote, value, close quote. Because capitalism cannot be fundamentally reformed, attempts to reform it lead to an intensification of state capitalism, not to socialism. We are not a political party, nor are we trying to lead the masses who will form their own organization and whose emancipation must be their own act. But we have seen that spontaneous actions alone are insufficient to usher in a new society. We seek a new unity of philosophy and organization in which mass movements striving for freedom lay hold of Marxist philosophy of revolution and recreate society on its basis. Our ideas and actions, as well as our structure and rules, are guided by the interests of working people and freedom movements of people of color, LGBTQ people, other minorities, women, youth, and all those around the world who are struggling for self-determination in order to freely develop their own human natures. We have no interests separate and apart from theirs. To this end, we open our website to the widest possible dialogue with people around the world. We intend to practice as well as espouse a two-way road between our organization and people outside it as essential to developing a single dialectic in the relationship of theory to practice and as the way to assure the survival of Marxist humanism. Please join us. What I'm unclear about is your response to Alegre and Fernandez ends with a discussion of political implications. And in particular, there is this very intriguing argument you make uh, linking the underconsumptionist theory of crisis to the physicalism uh, that they display. How do, are you able to do this in your chapter, given what seems to be the case that they don't themselves don't draw any political conclusions, and nor do I think that they mention uh, the underconsumptionist theory of crisis. So how are you able to bring it in into a discussion of their work in your response? Yeah, like I mentioned, in the whole chapter is not just talking about the book. It is a big chunk of it, but it deals with the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. So even if they don't mention that, and, and I also wouldn't like to, to put words in their mouth, maybe in the book that they uh, were writing, they thought that the law is inconsistent and they didn't follow with reformist or, or whatever conclusions. So I don't really focus on that. I just mentioned that in my view, I just explained what I what I just mentioned that the importance and the and the key place of the law in Marxist theory it's it's important it's 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 non-negotiable and it means that you need to look at capitalism as something that needs to be overcome. You can't apply patches and fix some things here and there because the system has a it has a logic of its own and capitalism Capitalists compete against each other and they try to get the most profit out of their investment. And the way the system works when they do that, it is riddled with such an internal contradiction with, with the search for an increase in productivity in order to reap more profits that leads to cyclical crisis. And it's not like anyone is in charge. You know, you can't say that, oh, hey, you got a capitalist and they are evil and we need to find some people have said patriotic businessmen who are willing to contribute to the country so that people have health care and stuff, which I mean, it's amazing if people have health care and it's something that's very important. But it doesn't, you can't really, I think, fall in the mind frame of uh, it depends on capitalists realizing that they need to behave well. You know, the system has a logic of its own. I don't know if I'm making sense. And if you. Oh, yeah, you're making, you're making, you're making a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, <laughs> In my experience, this is what um, the various reformists, especially what Brendan likes to call the left economic populists, this is what they hate above all. 
you know, they can speak about the logic of capital as well as anybody. But when you say the the system has its own logic mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter, you know, which faces are running the system, yeah. you know, whether it's Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders or whatever, the, the laws of capitalism are really what's in control. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden, a very unpleasant light dawns on them and they go, oh, my God, you know. Uh, no, 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 no. You know, you're just uh, economic determinist or something. Yeah. Wh whatever, whatever stuff that they, they sling. But yeah, it, it, it's the one kind of argument that the, they cannot uh, abide. And I, I, but, but in any case, I mean, what it sounds like to me, the way you bring in the political implications here seems entirely reasonable. Whatever Allegre and Fernandez had in mind or have in mind now, this debate has its own logic to it its own internal logic, and here are the real political implications that at the end of the day are at the root of, of, of this debate. This is ultimately what it is a debate over, is the, the attempt to make capitalism into something that it isn't and can't be. Most of all, I was intrigued by the way that you linked the physicalism of what they were doing to the underconsumptionist theory of crisis, because I've never seen it before, and I, I had never thought about it this way. So uh, I was wondering if you could, like, first of all, explain to people what the underconsumptionist theory of crisis is and then why you think it's linked to, to physicalism. As far as I know, the underconsumptionist theory of crisis is one of the schools or strains of thought within Marxism that thinks that the underlying causes of the different crises, they don't think is the, they fall in the rate of profit, but the inability of the working class to consume or to get the necessary income to keep consuming the means of consumption that capitalists put out. Uh, so capitalists need to close shop because they people aren't buying their commodities and then they fire people because they're closing their, their company. So more people are unemployed, less people that can buy stuff and the cycle starts, you know, uh, like a like a domino uh, starts falling and domino pieces and it gets to get bigger. The thing with the underconsumptionist theory is that it usually, at least from what I've read, lead to reformist alternatives because you can always say, hey, state could step in and they could, and the state could, you know, provide jobs or do or redistribute wealth or whatever so that the working class has enough income or at least enough, you know, money or purchasing power or whatever to, to buy means of consumption and, you know, uh, business businesses will, will flourish again and the economy will recover. So that's, I don't know if I explained that properly. Yeah, well, here's, here's what you wrote to, to Brendan and me. These people who think that crises come because of underconsumption, if capitalism is good at making more stuff out of the same stuff, the problem will come about if that stuff isn't well distributed. But the problem is on how the stuff is produced. Since value and money play a role there based on the labor of workers, it is not just a matter of how much stuff comes out. So you're making a link between understanding capitalism as the production of stuff, and, and which is physicalism, and, and, and yeah, and then the, the redistributionist argument. Yeah, because if productivity increases and if with increases in productivity, the rate of profit doesn't get depressed, but in fact rises because you get more stuff uh, out than you get that you need to put in in the production process, then the problem is not that there isn't stuff, you know, or that there isn't enough means of consumption or whatever being produced. It's just that stuff isn't getting evenly redistributed. So you need an authority or you need a political political party, preferably one that is that the author defending this is a member of, to step in and to say, let's take control of capitalism and redistribute the wealth and everyone, you know, everything will start running again. But, you know, if you follow the perspective of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, that is impossible because, you know, it doesn't depend on that. It doesn't depend on physical quantities. It's that's not the way it works, like we were mentioning before. So it's a it's a pressure that you've got even even if you try to redistribute everything evenly and if, even if you try to to make rich people pay taxes or whatever you know the, the idea is to make the underconsumptionism work as a theory and set of policy proposals you first have to get rid of the idea that capitalism is an unstable self-contradictory system whoever's in charge of it 
and you got to get rid of Marx's law of eventual fall and the rate of profit, and you need physicalism to do that. And then once you've buried all of that, you can say, ah, well, it's a stable system. It's just unfair, and you need us in charge to make it more fair. That 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 makes that makes sense to me as to the, the way these things usually shake out. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the, the I think the logic of where people who are attacking Marx are going, whether they realize it at uh, any moment or not. That's the logic of it in in general. But do you think that in Spain today or in the European Union today, there's any particular political implications of of this uh, debate into which you're entering? Yeah, like like I mentioned, I think it's so obscure that it's probably one of the bottom layers of, of the whole thing. I think it does filter like to the top layers in the way we were describing. Parties or, or people who want to become politicians or not even politicians, you know, pundits, theorists, or, you know, people who are trying to make a career in, in academia and get support of political forces. They look for answers that can sort of, in their view, uh, fix things, but they don't want to look for an answer that says, no, this is an indictment of the whole system, because that will make things very, very difficult for their purposes, which are very mundane and very tied to, you know, advancing, I guess, their, their own career or whatever, or their political party. So they need to find these sort of answers. So these answers get more exposure, they get more people promoting them, they get more people who are tweeting or sharing the links to the articles that say, you can have Marx, but you know, forget about the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, because that's something that only orthodox dinosaur Marxists defend, and it's just people who think that capitalism will collapse, and obviously that is wrong, and we need to rethink Marx, and we need to be unorthodox, and, and you know, Know, look forward and rethink stuff and forget about uh, though that the orthodoxy you need to, to think critically so in the end it ends up being very very useful to to follow in that political logic that I was mentioning or, or professional logic you know so not not to adopt the, the whole function functionalist explanation you know it's not just because it's useful it works no okay uh, it's it's a factor in why these answers or these uh, alternatives or these interpretations get more exposure, more people who are interested in them, because obviously you're going to be more interested in an answer that says, hey, you can keep doing what you're doing, and you also got a theoretical ground to defend that. And, you know, like you say in the US, uh, you can have your cake and eat it. You can say, I, I like Marx. Marx is really cool. We need to keep reading him. Very important. But, you know, when he says that the capitalist system needs to go away, mm, okay, forget about that. <laughs> he, he abandoned that in his essays, because then I will have to go away. Yeah, so what do we need Marx for yeah what do we need marx for well he was concerned with inequality yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and 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 the mudslinging and the the characterization of us as dinosaurs and orthodox and not engaged in critical thinking is first of all it's terribly insulting it's really uncalled for i mean i know that there are people like that but there are really good and strong criticisms of these people that are based very firmly on critical reasoning. And we criticize and we reason, and we, we deserve a response in kind, and we're not getting it. And that's the way ideology works. As, as Marx and Engels should have said, the ruling Marxist ideology of any age is the Marxist ideology of the ruling class. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I like to, to stress that I don't think that everyone who adopts that position is like the way I described before. I'm not saying, you know, because it will be also unfair, like in, in, a, in a sense to say, in the same way that it is to characterize the people who do defend the law of the rate of profit, of the tendential for the rate of profit as dinosaurs or orthodox, blah, blah, blah. It will be unfair. I'm not saying everyone is like that. I was just trying to explain, uh, you know, the sort of pressures or, or dynamics that might come into play to make some positions more likely to, to have exposure. But not everyone who thinks that is like that, of course. And if someone who thinks like that makes a point and, you know, uh, in a respectful and, and is, is willing to, to engage in a debate, that's that's amazing. And it's something to be, be cherished. And I'm actually thinking like the in your, I don't know if it was the last episode, one of the episodes you mentioned before where Patrick Murray, Murray came to, to debate with you. And I 
thought that was something that that was very very good and very useful to debate and to be able to exchange ideas and not just to ignore what the other part is saying because it doesn't make sense with all what you are trying to achieve well, thank you so much um yeah, thank you so and much. i i really look forward to reading your mm -hmm. if it gets translated reading your response when, when it's completed great thank you very much uh it's a pleasure talking to you guys i mean we'll stay in touch of course and i'll let you know how things go let's talk soon you have been listening to radio free humanity the marxist humanist podcast if you like the podcast please do subscribe share it with your friends and enemies and we'd love to hear from you so don't be a stranger you can write to us at marxisthumanistinitiative.org and we'd love to discuss these issues or anything else Thank you.